Welcome, everybody. Um, just want to say a few words before we, before we get started. Uh, I'm Dan Slater from the Department of Political Science, and I'm the director of uh, CISER, which is the Center for International Social Science Research, which is a new center we're just uh, getting going this spring, and in fact, tonight is our, our inaugural event. So we're really, really fortunate to have Jeff Frieden here from the government department at, at Harvard to give sort of the inaugural uh, lecture for the, for the new center. And I uh, just want to say a couple words of, uh, of, of thanks before getting going. This is not, uh, as with any center, it's a collective effort. And so I've got a really terrific advisory board that's been helping, helping out and trying to put together uh, programming books for the spring and then selecting a really terrific group of, of, uh, of faculty and PhD student fellows for, for next year and really try to raise the profile of, of international social science uh, at the University of Chicago, try to build a center that's really focused on research in, in that area. So uh, Luis Martinez from, uh, from the Harris School of Public Policy, Paul Post from the Political Science Department, also uh, Emily Osborne from History and Jenny Trinitopoli from Sociology have also been serving the advisory board. And we've really got, we're gonna have a really, really great range of, uh, of fellows selected for, for next year. We're gonna have uh, seven faculty fellows who've all gotten support for their research and they come from political science, they come from public policy, psychology, anthropology, and we're also giving support to, uh, to PhD students who can actually get some office space and some support for, for their work. And the students who've been selected for fellowships range from, we have history, economics, sociology, and political science. So the idea is really kind of get this, this center going, and it's going to be you know, very much something for uh, the UChicago community. But uh, as a way of kind of launching and kind of getting on the, on the stage and making our appearance. We're gonna have actually three book conferences for UChicago faculty this spring. The first one will be for, uh, for Bobby Gulati uh, in political science. And uh, so what we've managed to do is bring people out for the book workshops to serve as discussants and then also offer uh, a lecture on some of the research they're doing. And again, the idea of the center is very much focused on not just having conversations about things that interest us, but really focused on really top level research. And so in that respect, I you know, really literally couldn't imagine a better person to come and kick us off than, than Jeff Frieden um, from Harvard. He's gonna be talking about his recently published book with Princeton University Press, which is called Currency Politics. Um, I don't need to do a whole lot to introduce Jeff. If you, if you know anything about the fields of comparative political economy or international political economy, he's truly one of the giants in the field and has been so for some time. I don't want to make him feel old. I don't want to make me feel old. But I will say that when I wrote my master's back in 1996, back in my, my former life, I worked on development strategies in not just Southeast Asia, but Latin America. And, and Jeff's book, Debt Development and Democracy in Latin America, was a, a huge influence uh, Back in, back in the mid-90s. So uh, in any event, without further ado, uh, I just want to uh, turn things over to, to Jeff and-, and Thank you, Dan. Um, it's, <laughs> I appreciate that. But uh, I did write that book when I was in kindergarten, right? So that's a, um, it's a great pleasure to be, I admit it's a little bit intimidating. I didn't realize this was the inaugural lecture, but I suppose the positive is that uh, at the very least, I can make everybody else look good. I don't want people to come after me. Uh, as Dan says, this is about uh, work that I did leading up to and incorporated into this book that was published a little while ago. But I'm since you know since I'm sure you've all bought multiple copies and read it. Um, I'm going to go over some of the issues in the book, but then also try to talk about some work that's related to it that takes takes some of the empirical applications and and some of the implications a little bit farther than the book itself. So. Exchange rate policy is crucially important. Um, those of you who've taken international macroeconomics may recall um, the, the line that you almost always get in an international macro class, which is that the exchange rate is the most important price in every economy, or any economy, because it affects all other prices. The exchange, it's really the only price that can affect all other prices almost instantaneously. And as you know, and as we know, the exchange rate, at least in today's world, moves around a lot. Right? So, so uh, the exchange rate is a crucially important variable in economic activity. Um, it's also the case that in virtually the entirety of the economic literature, there will be discussion about the exchange rate, and there will then be some recognition that the exchange rate is something that is either set by or strongly influenced by the government. Right? Usually the, the analysis by the economist stops there, right? because they're, not, they're either not interested in or not, don't feel capable of analyzing the politics of exchange rate policy, but that's really what I want to do. There is, of course, a huge economic literature. In macro, the, exchange, the issue of the exchange rate and its implications is probably the central issue in modern international macroeconomics and even macroeconomics more broadly. There's a big literature 
on specific exchange rate policies, uh, that is floating rates versus fixed rates, optimal currency areas, things like that. Um, and almost all that literature ends up, whether it's on fixed versus floating, whether it's on, on strong versus weak, ends up, ends up recognizing the centrality of political variables in determining whether what, it, what the exchange rate policy of a particular government will be. Nonetheless, there have only been um, some isolated case studies. That's a little bit unfair. People looking at the euro or the development of the euro or individual country cases or currency, cri currency crashes. Um, but there's not or there hasn't been a whole lot of general attempts to understand the politics of exchange rate pro policy more, more, more broadly. Um, that has changed a bit. I mean, it, you know, Dan has kindly pointed out, pointed out how old I am. Um, it, I used to be able to say that I was the world's leading expert on the politics of exchange rate policy because I was the only one. That's no longer true. There are now a bunch of people who are interested in the politics of exchange rate policy. Um, but it's still, in my view at least, and of course I'm, I'm biased, but in my view it's an, it's an issue area that has not gotten and, and continues not to get anywhere near the attention that it deserves given its centrality. Um, I did a, 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 a monograph for uh, an international organization on issues in international economic policy with a few colleagues and f with very different points of view and perspectives and coming from different parts of the world. And one thing we could agree on was that macroeconomic policy and especially exchange rate policy was far more important to the future of the international economic order than trade policy. And we, in fact, we titled one of the chapters that we eventually wrote saying macro is the new trade. And I really believe that. I really think that if you look around the world, the variations in exchange rates and movements of exchange rates have had much more impact on, tr on both trades in, trends in trade and foreign direct investment and international finance than has, uh, than has trade policy itself. That may be a function of the fact that much of the trade policy action has already to some extent taken place, given we live in a world of very low trade barriers. Nonetheless, I do, that's, that's my little plug for those of you who are thinking about dissertation topics, um, to think about exchange rate issues, uh, which I know Bobby has, uh, and others as well, as, as being crucially important. Well, um, in order to be able to think seriously and systematically about, about any economic policy issue, you need, a, I think, a, a very clear picture of what the stakes are, that is, who the what the distributional effects of these policies are, at least the way I think about an exchange, uh, any, any kind of economic policy, is first thinking about who, are, who stands to gain, who stands to lose from a particular policy choice. And the, the um, comparison that I would draw, which to some extent highlights the extent to which exchange rate policy or the analysis of exchange rate policy is somewhat underdeveloped, is trade policy which is extremely well developed. Trade policy is arguably the best developed area in, not only in all of, of international political economy, but it probably in all of political economy. Um, that there's, there, are, there have been systematic analyses of the politics of international trade going back, well, you could say going back to Adam Smith and David Ricardo, but really in the modern era going back to the 1920s and 30s and 40s, some of the foundational texts of both international economics and international relations and for that matter even American politics are about the political economy of trade. Um, and the, at least I would argue that one reason why the trade literature is so well developed is that it rests on very firm theoretical foundations. Back in the 1940s, Stolper and Samuelson set forth what is now a canonical and classic, perhaps wrong, but classic article arguing about who were expected to be the winners and losers from trade protection or trade liberalization. And that, that set of expectations allowed analytical and empirical researchers to go forward and say, well, here's what theory tells us to expect in the politics of, exchange, of trade policy. And now we can go out and see whether the world looks the way Stolper Samuelson or later on Ricardo Viner or other models say it's going to look. So we have lots and lots of rigorous theoretical treatments of who we expect to be the winners and losers of different trade policies, which is a very important foundation stone upon which to build, uh, an, uh, whether it's a theoretically grounded or a more empirical analysis of any economic policy making, in this case of trade policy. Um, without that foundation stone, it's hard to think about all of the things that we'd like to think about in political economy. That is, what's the role of institutions? What's the role of bargaining across states? What's the role of domestic political factors? You need, you know, I mean, this is belying, I think, my bias, but 
But the, the, the basis, I think, is typically what are the distributional effects of policies and how are those reflected in the political arena, whether within a country or across countries. And we don't, again, exaggerating a little bit, we don't really have uh, agreement on how to think about that in the exchange rate realm. And that's really, to some extent, been the focus of the work that I've been doing on exchange rates for 20 years now. Sorry, I'm, I hate to admit it, but 20 years now, maybe even more. So to try to structure the discussion of this, it seems to me, and this is, again, a sort of a general, uh, argue, a general point, just thinking about the making of any economic policy, it seems to me useful to say, well, what are the choices available to government? Right? What, are the, what are the decision variables? What are the trade-offs each of those choices represents? And how might they be weighted? Why might some people weight more one trade-off, one side of the trade-off more highly than others? And then who might be doing the weighting? Why might some people or some groups or some countries weight one side of the trade-offs more than others? And that's the general structure of a lot of what we do in political economy, and that's sort of what I'm trying to lay out here. So let me talk about the choices available to government. There are two dimensions of exchange rate policy, simplifying somewhat. Um, the first is the regime. Now, the term regime is used in a variety of different contexts in talking about everything, but including about exchange rates. The first is the international regime. So the gold standard was an international exchange rate regime. We have uh, the Bretton Woods system was an international regime. When we're talking about national policy making. The regime simply means the choice on the part of the government, because it does have to be an explicit government policy choice, uh, the, the choice on the part of the government as to whether to fix the exchange rate to an anchor. The anchor could be another currency. It could be a gold. In the case of the gold standard, it could be silver. Right? Whether to fix the currency or whether to allow it to float. And you can imagine virtually any uh, a continuum which stops all the way from uh, completely fixed, in fact, even going beyond that, giving up your own currency and adopting someone else's currency. There are many countries in the world that have adopted the US dollar or have adopted, and there are, of course, countries that have given up their currencies and joined the euro, the common currency, um, or a, some, what's called a currency board, which is a very, very fixed rate against an individual currency, the dollar or the euro, which, many, again, many countries have. The other extreme is a freely floating exchange rate in which the government does not intervene purposefully um, or explicitly in currency markets to try to affect the value of the currency, which is where the US and most of the big industrial countries currently stand. Now, that doesn't mean that national policy doesn't affect the exchange rate, because lots of things that governments do affect the exchange rate. But what floating means is simply that the currency is allowed to fluctuate in line with whatever currency markets think it should be determined by. So what are the trade-offs associated with this? Uh, the value, oops, going the wrong way, um, the value of a fixed rate is that it buys stability. Now, it obviously buys stability in the foreign exchanges. It stabilizes uh, cross-country trade, investment, finance. And there's a fair amount of, of pretty substantial evidence that this effect is very, is very significant. Um, Andy Rose has a famous article from quite a while ago in which he estimated that countries with, that shared a currency, this is about not just a fixed rate, but sharing a currency, the countries that shared a currency realized a 300% increase in their trade over countries that didn't. Now, Andy's probably the only person who believes those results. Nonetheless, there have been a lot of other studies that none of which find small numbers. The smallest number I know of in a study that looks at countries, in this case, not sharing a currency, but either on the gold standard or having fixed rates with one another, fi credible fixed rates with one another, the smallest number I know is 30%. So a 30% increase in trade is huge. It's bigger than the elimination of all trade barriers in the world could achieve. Right? So that's one of the examples of, of how important exchange rates can be in this kind of thing. So stability in the foreign exchanges. But not only in the foreign exchanges, a fixed rate also brings domestic macroeconomic stability because typically countries fix their currencies against low inflation anchors. So an Argentina will, over and over and over again, uh, fix its currency against the dollar when it has 5,000% inflation, will fix its, its the, the, whatever the Argentine currency of the week is called against the US dollar in order to bring inflation down. Right? And one of the arguments for countries that joined the European monetary system and eventually the euro um, not, not for all of them, but one of the arguments for some of the uh, southern European countries was that it would stabilize their domestic macroeconomic and especially monetary conditions by, by f importing the low inflation environment of the anchor country, in this case of Germany. Right? So it brings not only cross-border stability on the foreign exchanges, but domestic monetary stability as well. That's the credibility factor that, that uh, is referred to here. Right? So 
Those are all good things. It increases cross-border trade, investment finance, uh, leads to greater integration with world markets, stabilizes domestic monetary conditions, expectations about domestic macroeconomic conditions. What could be bad? What's bad is that it gives up what is probably the single most powerful tool of national macroeconomic policy, that is monetary policy. If you fix your exchange rate, you have no more monetary policy. Um, this is well, I mean, both sides of this trade-off are well uh, demonstrated by the experience of the aftermath of the global financial crisis that began in late 2007. Um, the U.S. responded, most of the G7, most of the major countries responded primarily, in some cases exclusively, with monetary policy. And I wouldn't say the recovery was a great one, but without that monetary policy, without, uh, without the ability to implement a flexible monetary policy, the recovery from the crisis would have been much more disastrous than it was. And the indication of that is the countries that were stuck in the Eurozone, so to speak, and had effectively no ability to, to, uh, to adopt their own national monetary policies to address what was, in some cases, a crisis even more severe than that of the 1930s. So countries like Spain, Portugal, Ireland, Greece, that had given up their monetary policy found that, in fact, giving up monetary policy, losing that policy flexibility, can be extremely costly. I'll come back to some other cases that, in many ways, are even more expressive, particularly the Baltic states, which had fixed rates against the euro. They weren't in the eurozone at the time, but they had fixed rates against the euro and experienced some of the biggest drops in GDP in modern European history. So there's a, there's a real cost to giving up your exchange rate as a policy uh, tool. So that's the, those are the trade-offs on the regime side. Stability on the one hand, credibility on the other hand, giving a, a, you, you policy flexibility, which is valuable. The second dimension of exchange rate policy is the level. And before anybody objects, I'm not saying that governments can set the, the exchange rate as strong or weak at will. There are lots of other factors that go into that, but there's vast evidence that government policy has a very powerful impact on the level of the real exchange rate, whether an exchange rate is real. And I'm going to use high to mean strong or overvalued or appreciated and low to mean undervalued or depreciated or weak, even though those of you who do Latin America or developing countries are used to it being the other way around. Right? So that's the, 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 the way we usually think about these exchange rates. High means a strong exchange rate. Um, and the, so the, 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 although there, of course, are limits to how much a government can affect the level of the real exchange rate, there's, as I say, very substantial evidence that in the short to medium run, the effect is very significant. That is, to take, just to cite some studies, uh, again, there's there are differences among the studies, but the general, the general finding is that when the nominal exchange rate moves, it takes between three and five years for it to revert half of the way back towards its real exchange rate. Well, three to five years in economic terms may be short to medium run, but in political terms, it's you know, almost an infinity. It certainly past the next election. So, so this is, this is a, a, a very substantial impact on domestic economic activity, the level of the real exchange rate. So what are the trade-offs here? Well, uh, a weak or low real exchange rate um, makes goods produced in your country cheaper on foreign markets and makes foreign goods more expensive on your markets. This is what you may recall uh, in macro as the substitution effect. Because if the exchange rate weakens, consumers, both at home and abroad, not just your own consumers, but consumers at home and abroad, will substitute out of foreign goods into domestically produced goods. So the dollar gets weaker, and Americans buy more American goods and fewer foreign goods, and foreigners buy more American goods and fewer foreign goods. Right? So a weak real exchange rate uh, gives, Im improves the competitive position of your domestic producers. Right? So what could be wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with it, or not what's wrong with it, the trade-off here is weakening the real exchange rate is reducing the purchasing power of your citizens. The weaker the exchange rate is, the weaker the currency is, the less people can buy with their money, the less of the world's goods they can buy with their money, and the less even of domestic goods as well, right? because prices are passed through. Um, I, I, I find uh, people in much of the rest of the world especially the developing world, understand this intuitively from their experience. Typically, Americans have a lot of trouble with it when I'm 
teaching undergraduates and trying to talk about this, it always ends up being something about spring break. If you're going to Mexico and the peso is weak, is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? Um, but you know, the fact is that it's a much broader impact than, than, than Cabo San Lucas or, or, uh, or spring break in Cancun. But the fact is that a, a, a weak real exchange rate really does diminish the purchasing power of your citizens. And it's especially, the, the effect is especially important and in some cases almost immediate in small open economies or economies that are importing a lot of the goods that are generally consumed. I'll come back to that when I talk about some of the electoral implications of, of government manipulation of exchange rates, okay? So how do we translate those trade-offs into thinking about winners and losers, the distributional considerations, right? Well, first, uh, it seems to me uh, at least compelling or plausible that those that are more exposed to international or cross-border or cross-currency exchanges are going to be, generally speaking, more favorable to stabilizing the exchange rate, right? If you're investing abroad, if you're writing long-term contracts with customers or suppliers abroad, if you are lending abroad, if you are borrowing abroad, then fluctuations in the exchange rate can be very damaging. They can be positive, they can be negative, but they, they introduce a volatility that can be very costly, right? Um, so, generally speaking, I expect those economic actors who are econo internationally exposed to be more concerned about volatility and all else equal, always an all, all, else, all, an all else equal clause, to be generally more supportive of fixing. And a very important um, observation here, especially important for developing countries, but not only, is the role of those that have substantial foreign, foreign currency liabilities, that is, who have borrowed in foreign currency abroad. And this is an experience that almost every country in the developing world, every country that has access to international financial markets has experienced. Um, your big companies or your government borrows billions of dollars in dollars because international banks basically lend in dollars or euro. They don't lend in reals or, or in pesos, right? So your big banks or your big corporations or your government borrow heavily in dollars um, and there's a depreciation and all of a sudden the domestic currency cost of servicing your debt has gone up 30, 40, 50, even more percent. Um, virtually every major currency crisis in the developing world in the last 40 years or so right, has as a crucially important component of this the the effect of a major devaluation on the solvency of foreign currency debtors. Right? Um, and it, for those of you who know, Latin America in the early 80s, uh, Mexico in 94, East Asia in, or Asia more generally in the 90s, and then whether it's Turkey, Russia, Argentina, all the currency crises that we've seen since then, in every case, probably the single biggest shock of the crisis was a major devaluation that led to essentially the bankrupting of the entire private sector and the government as well. Right. Um, so foreign, those with foreign currency liabilities feel very strongly about this. And again, we can come back to that in, in some of the empirical applications. On the other hand, those who are producing tradable goods, right, that is goods that enter into international trade, um, are going to be much more concerned about the relative price of their output. Uh, that is the substitution effect I talked about before, and in particular are going to be much more in interested in the government's ability to depreciate the currency and improve their international competitive position. Right? So if we think in the U.S., who complains about a strong dollar? It's the steel industry, the textile industry, the auto industry sometimes, farmers, people who are producing traded goods that enter into world trade. A strong currency hurts their competitive position, they want flexibility also because they want a depreciated currency. Right? You, can't, you can't depreciate your currency if you don't have a flexible currency, right? if you're on a fixed rate. Um, there's a, a complication here, and I never know whether to go into it and whether I'm going to have time to do it. I'll mention it and we can come back to it in questions and answers. It's sort of my obsession um, these days, one of them, um, which is that all of this sh is tempered by something called pass-through. And pass-through is the extent to which an exchange rate movement is passed through to domestic prices. And just to give you an example, uh, if you think of wheat, right, if the, the world price of wheat is set in dollars, and if you're in Australia or Argentina or Brazil, if the currency moves, the domestic price of wheat moves immediately 
to keep, keep it consistent with the world price of, of, of wheat. That's not true about things like cars or computers or stereos or complicated product differentiated goods. Right? In those instances, for a variety of reasons, largely because the sellers of these goods are interested in market share for reputational and brand name recognition and service and other reasons, goods prices don't move with the exchange rate. Right? And this, goes, the observa this observation goes back to the 1980s when the US dollar was very, very strong and then dropped by about 50%. And there was a, an expectation that Japanese, one of the, the trade problems of the day was Japanese cars in the US. And the expectation was as the drop dollar depreciated against the yen by 50%, the Japanese car prices would rise by an equivalent amount, and they didn't. And the reason was that Toyota and the other Japanese car producers didn't want to lose market share. They didn't want to have to raise the price of their goods, which would, which would cause lots of competitive long-term problems. And, and this turns out to be a very, very common phenomenon, especially in advanced economies. Right? So there is, there is variation in the degree of pass-through. And it's by industry and by product, in some cases even by firm. And that affects the intensity of producers' preferences over the exchange rate. So as I'm just going to mention that. If I have time, I'll come back to it. Or if I don't have time, you can ask about it in questions and answers, and we can talk about it some more. It's, it's, it's the kind of complication that I think is crucial to pushing work on the exchange rate forward, just as thinking much more about things other than you know, broad factors of production or industries and trade policy are crucial to thinking about what trade policy looks like today. OK, so I'm going to. I'm going to skip this because I want to get to the empirics. Um, the, but I, I'll come back to it. This is just talking about in, in more detail about what the pass-through uh, considerations imply for thinking about thinking analytically about the politics of exchange rates in, in more complex industries and in a more, in a more subtle way than I'm used to, or than I will, at least, and I'm used to. Um, so I've talked almost exclusively about what you might think of as special interest politics. Big firms, big industries, importers, banks, international investors, what their interests are. But the exchange rate is also very important for broad macroeconomic trends. And given that, um, it's clear that it may also have lots of implications for elections, right? Because in a democracy, or for that matter, I think in almost any political system, either the interests of the electorate, the mass electorate, or of the selectorate, if you will, or mass public opinion may matter. And so remember in this context that a strong currency is allowing, is increasing the purchasing power of consumers. Right? It's allowing consumers to buy more. Um, this is the income effect. Right? The substitution effect is you, if you would appreciate the currency, people substitute into your goods. The income effect is the stronger the currency, the higher you, the real income of your consumers. Right? I, I alluded before to the experience that many of us who work in develop, have worked in developing countries uh, no, and, and those who work in Latin America, I think, can know when the dollar, when a, a national currency is strong against the dollar, right, people go on buying sprees because the cheapest thing in town is the dollar. So they'll, sometimes they'll just borrow dollars, but sometimes, you know, I mean, you, they'll, they'll just load the, again, the wealthier residents, middle class or often middle class residents, will load up on TVs and and cameras and, and phones and computers and cars and all sorts of other things. Venezuela was famous at a point ha for having a very, very strongly appreciated dollar back in the 1970s and into the 1980s. And, at that, and, and when it had such an appreciated cu currency, rather, I believe, the domestic currency. And in that period, Venezuela was the world's largest per capita importer and consumer of luxury cars, perf luxury perfume, and Scotch whiskey, right? So just huge quantities of consumption of this. Not, you know, this is not mass consumption, but it gives you a sense. And, and just again, anecdotally, when Latin American currencies are strong against the dollar, and you, if you travel to Latin America from Miami or New York or whatever, you'll see that the, the plane is going to be full of Latin Americans coming back to Argentina or Chile or Brazil or whatever it may be, just loaded down with electronic equipment that they can get much more cheaply because their currency is so strong relative to the dollar. Right? So that, that's, that's, again, anecdotal. The reality is that in small open economies, consumers actually do realize a benefit from a strong currency. And whether they recognize that it's a strong currency or not, it, it is associated with a boost to current consumption by, by the mass public. 
So that gives the governments in question a uh, an incentive to encourage a strong currency in election periods, just like we think of political business cycles where the governments have an incentive to boost the economy via fiscal or monetary means, um, they may also have an incentive to boost the economy using the exchange rate in election periods. And, and that, that, of course, you know, then we can bring all of our political science kinds of considerations to bear to think about what might affect the incentive of a government to manipulate the exchange rate for electoral purposes. Right? Anyway, so this, just summarizing before I turn to some of the empirics, um, I expect the internationally exposed uh, economic actors, foreign investors, those with foreign currency liabilities, exporters of complex manufacturers, international financial institutions to be more favorable, everything else equal to fixing, tradables producers especially in simple manufacturers and commodities to be more interested in floating in an appreciated currency, consumers to want an appreciated currency, forget about pass through for now. So, you know, a simple picture would be, think about special interest pressures from internationally exposed sectors for a fixed relatively strong rate, from tradables producers for a floating relatively weak rate, and then these broad electrical pressures from consumers. So, some evidence, and this is, f I'll start with what's in the book. The first is a series of studies of exchange rate policy in the U.S., specifically in the gold standard period, um, and I'll talk about that briefly because it's actually, it's one of my favorite uh, applications of thinking about the policy of exchange rate, very important period. Um, I have some work on European monetary integration leading up to the adoption of the euro, not, and then some since then, uh, studies of Latin American currency policy, and I want to talk a little bit today about things that are not in the book, and that is the transition economies and, and, and some other uh, more micro studies as well. Um, this is just, this is one of the micro studies, and this is joint work with Steve Weymouth and Lawrence Brose, and it is, I don't want to go into too much detail, again, because I, I want to leave time for discussion, but this is based on surveys of, of firm managers in the developing world. And what it picks up is that um, manufacturing firms, these are tradables producers in developing countries, uh, turn out to be, or, well, let me start with the, the counterfactual, is that non-manufacturing firms, when asked how important the exchange rate is for their business, let me go back a step. So there's this survey of firm managers in the developing world. And they ask really stupid questions, like how big a problem is the exchange rate for your business? I mean, we just, you, know, just, you, so you look at this and just say, oh my god, couldn't they have just asked us before they did the survey? But they ask, how big a problem is the exchange rate? Um, but it's a really huge survey with you know, tens of thousands of firm managers around the developing world, so it's a valuable thing to use. What we were able to do was go back and figure out what had happened to the individual countries, because there's 80 country, 81 countries around the world, what, would, what had happened to the country's currency in the months before the survey. Right? So what was the level of the currency in the months before the survey? And so we were able to identify instances in which the currency was getting much stronger, or the currency was getting much weaker, things like that. And so now just to focus for the sake of, 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 of fixing ideas on instances in which the currency, the real exchange rate was appreciating, imp appreciating significantly, right? we, the non-manufacturing, that is people in the non-tradable sector, reported no change in how much of a problem the exchange rate was. But manufacturers, the stronger the exchange rate was, the more of a problem it was for manufacturing firms. Right? And so looking at these many thousands of responses in 81 countries, the, the result is that um, the probability that a manufacturing uh, manager, firm manager, will regard the exchange rate as a major obstacle to, its, to his or her business increases by about 25%, which is very significant, almost doubles. Right? every time the currency moves about 10%, which is not that big a deal. Right? So, so this is just some micro-level evidence um, that, in fact, the, what we expect to see in the distributional response to exchange rate movements is, in fact, observed. So let me turn to some of the more macro evidence. Um, as you may know, the gold standard was, along with the tariff, probably the single biggest economic policy issue in the U.S. for decades and decades and decades. Four presidential elections were fought over it, uh, um, and quest, you know, arguably the most famous speech in all of um, famous campaign speech in all of American political history was about the gold standard. It was William Jennings Bryan at the Democratic Convention here in Chicago, actually in 1896, who who proclaimed, "Thou shalt not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold." Right? That's the famous cross of gold speech. It was all about the gold standard. It was all about the exchange rate. Right? The U and, and so a little bit of background, because people 
often know there was a populist movement, the populist, different kind of populist than today. Much better. Um, <laughs> they actually had very clear policy prescriptions, very clear policies. They knew what they wanted, and, and most of what they wanted has since been implemented. So anyway, that's a little too partisan, but anyway. Um, I, it always bothers me that the name, the word, the term populism has taken on such a negative connotation when the populists actually were, were among the most admirable of American political movements at the time. Anyway, the, a lot of people don't know the backdrop to this. So the U.S. went off gold in the middle of the Civil War in 1862 in order to be able to print money to finance the war effort. And this, it actually turned out, this was the first time the federal government, in fact, the first time we actually had a national currency. We had state currencies or banknotes before then. So during the Civil War, the federal government starts printing national banknotes, which are called greenbacks. Um, and, and at that point, we have a floating paper currency standard. After the war ends, there is a big discussion over whether we should go back to gold, and if we're going to go back to gold, at what exchange rate we should go back to gold. For those of you who know your European history, this is reminiscent of the debate in Britain in the 1920s over whether Britain should go back to the gold standard uh, after World War I. But this was a big debate. There were many people in the U.S. that felt that we should stay on a floating paper currency standard. Those people, they didn't include at the time, but subsequently those people include Milton Friedman who thought that going back to gold was a stupid idea. Um, and, and ha seriously hampered American economic growth. But there were lots of people in the U.S. who felt that the U.S. should stay on a paper currency standard. Um, that eventually morphed into not a paper currency standard, but a silver standard for complicated reasons. But being on silver would have meant being on a depreciated exchange rate, a depreciated currency against gold, floating against gold because the price of silver floated against the price of gold and the price of silver, silver had depreciated dramatically against gold in the previous years and was continuing to depreciate. So really what the populace wanted was a currency depreciation. They wanted the, the dot, they, or put it differently, they did not want the U.S. to go back to gold at an appreciated or strong exchange rate. And, 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 and they fought that battle between 1865 and 1879. They lost. The country went back to gold in 1879, and then from the 1880s onward, the populists fought for the U.S. to go off gold and onto a depreciated floating currency uh, or, or depreciated flexible silver currency standard. Right. Um, so the battle in the 1860s and 70s was whether to go back to gold. The battle in the 1880s and 90s was whether to stay on gold or to go on to silver. And so what I expect in the, in this instance. Um, looking at the, the politics of gold in the U.S., is that tradables producers, that is farmers in particular, will want the depreciated currency, either greenbacks or silver. Um, manufacturers, interesting, manufacturers were very favorable to uh, greenbacks and did not want to go back to gold in the 1860s and 70s. Once that battle was lost, they turned their attention to an alternative, which was trade protection. Right? So American, this is, for those of you familiar with this, this is very reminiscent of the, what led to the marriage of iron and rye in Prussia. Um, having lost the battle over the gold standard, the manufacturers said, well, if we can't get you know, greenbacks, let's at least get trade protection. And they put on a big push to dramatically increase the level of trade protection that manufacturing got in the U.S. And they were successful. So you know, the manufacturers had an alternative to a weak exchange rate. The alternative was trade protection. Farmers did not have an alternative because American farmers, as you probably know at the time, were heavy, heavy exporters. So two-thirds of American farm products were exported, right? um, and trade protection wasn't going to re really help them. So for them, as, as they often said in the debates, you know, manufacturers get protection. Silver, or a weak, what we would now say, a weak currency is our equivalent of protection. Right? And sometimes they would say, Let's form a coalition. You know, we'll support your protection for manufactured products if you support a depreciated currency for our products. So um, that's the, 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 expect, the expectations, the principal support um, for a, a depreciated currency from the export producers. And then the principal supporters of uh, the, the gold standard being in the international financial and commercial uh, sectors, in the Northeast in particular. Right? Um, the, uh, Keep in mind that in this period, the U.S. is the world's biggest borrower, not lender. So commercial and financial interests are aware of the fact that American access to international finance is largely contingent upon being on the gold standard. 
That is, that international bankers are not going to lend to the U.S. if we're not on gold. Gold was seen as a good housekeeping seal of approval. And in fact, Frieden, this is one of the reasons Frieden was against gold, um, that, that, that every time there was a threat of our going off the gold standard, the charge on American borrowing rose by 300 basis points, 3%, which went from about 2.5% to 5.5%. Or we were simply cut out of international financial markets. Right? And the same thing was true about short-term trade credits and to some extent also about trade, right? that, that there was evidence and the, the commercial elites felt that, and had experience in the 60s and 70s, felt that the volatility of the dollar was depressing international demand for American goods because people didn't know what they were going to end up cost, costing as the dollar bounced around. So the principal supporters were in these international financial and commercial sectors. Um, and wrong way. Um, so that's what I do, what I'm able to do, uh, because we have very good data on the U.S., is on, on the left-hand side on the dependent variable, look at voting on the gold standard in the 1860s and 70s over whether we should go back or not, and then in the 1890s over whether sh we should go on to silver. There were hundreds and hundreds of bills introduced into Congress, either to keep us off gold in the first instance or to take us off gold in the second. They were very prominent, right? Um, it was, you know, typically if you were from a pro-gold district and you voted against your district, you were in big trouble and vice versa. So pretty sincere voting. So I have all these votes on on uh, gold standard related issues. And then we have lots and lots of socioeconomic data from the districts of the members of Congress, senators, but especially from the House of Representatives. And what I try to do is see if, in fact, these expectations are borne out. And surprise, surprise, I wouldn't be talking about them if they weren't, I suppose. Surprise, surprise, they are. That, that support for going off gold is to be found primarily in these export-oriented tradable goods producers. And, so, and it's not, I, I'll come back to that in a minute. And, the, so I, I'll give you an example, because I'm not going to talk about the data in the book, but I'll give you an example that I think is expressive. Um, in the 1860s and 1870s, this debate was, was very lively. And at some point, I realized, well, I'm just sort of treating agriculture as if it were monolithic. But American agriculture was highly differentiated. Some farmers were producing cotton, tobacco, rice, um, sugar, goods that enter into international trade, export goods. But there were a lot of American farmers who were producing what we would now, were, were, were in what we would now call truck farms, right, producing fruits and vegetables, dairy products for the local market that weren't entering into world trade. So rather than just take farmers as an undifferentiated mass, I said, well, why don't we try to figure out what the differences are between farmers who are producing for world markets and those producing for the local market, because they, sh they should have different interests in the exchange rate. So I tortured a poor undergraduate for a year uh, to go through the 1870 census. And it, it, the, the problem was that in the 1870 census, there's lots of data on farm products and farm production, but it's of the following type. It's by county. And it would say, this county produced 100,000 gallons of milk, 200,000 bushels of wheat, 300,000 pounds of peaches, whatever it might be, no price data. So this poor undergraduate who survived and has gotten a PhD and gone on, um, but this had to go, I had him go out and get farm gate prices for all these products and convert them all into dollars. So it took a year. And finally, when we finally had the data and were able to apply it to the voting behavior of people from these districts, it turned out in, that, in fact, there was a fundamental difference between uh, con congressmen who came from districts whose farmers were producing for the local market, who were either indifferent to or opposed to staying on a floating paper, cur paper currency, and farmers who came from, uh, co uh, congressmen who came from farm districts that were heavily oriented towards export products, who almost monolithically voted to stay off gold, right? So that's an example of the kind of application. One of the reasons I really like this study is that it allows us to actually match political behavior with socioeconomic characteristics of constituents, which is very hard to do because, you know, it's not like a lot of other policies where, where there are differentiated, but you, you, the exchange rate is the exchange rate. There's one policy. In this case, there was voting on this policy over and over and over again in Congress. We had lots of data on the constituents of the congressmen, and so to some extent, I think it's the strongest evidence I have for these kinds of sectoral effects. Okay. Um, let's see. What do I, what do I want to... Yeah, so I want to, as I say in the, in the book, I, I talk also about the process of European monetary integration and about Latin American currency crises, but I want to talk a little bit more uh, about these electoral issues because they 
I think they're important. They're perhaps more centrally, obviously, political science-y or political economy-ish, uh, and, and in my experience, at least, political scientists um, can identify with or, or find them more interesting. So I'm going I'm to talk a little bit about these, these electoral factors. The, o the obvious point being that we have good reason to believe that there are electorals or there could be elect or incentives for governments to engineer uh, electoral cycles and exchange rate policy depending on who the median voter is. Remember that consumers benefit from an appreciated currency because it's raising the purchasing power of consumers. Uh, exporters benefit from a depreciation or trade, you know, tradables producers more generally. Um, and so this is an example. This is just all of the Latin American elections for executive president typically over a 35 year period. And zero here is the, the, the month of the election. It's a 20, week, a 20 month window. And you can see this is simply the nominal exchange rate. And this is just the descriptive statistics. There's no fancy footwork here, but I have, we have done studies of this. But you can see that there's no real trend in the nominal exchange rate in the 10 months before the election. But in the two months after, on average, the exchange rate depreciates by between 15 and 20 percent. The implication being that governments are delaying a depreciation of the currency because they know it would be politically unpopular to the mass public or to voters more generally. Right? So that's, that's one example. Um, when I, I've done more systematic analyses using a hazard model and some other things, and for ex looking at currency pegs, right, that, which is uh, one way of thinking about these cycles, that in the months before an election, a government is 10% on average, this is countries throughout the developing world, 10% less likely to go off a peg in the months before an election, and approximately 10% more likely to go off a peg after an election. Um, this is, oops, uh, this is a, the real exchange rate, different sample, Latin America again showing a real appreciation in the run-up to an election and then a real depreciation in the aftermath of the election. But this is East Asia. So these are East Asian elections and we see a very different trend. That is, there tends to be a depreciation before the election. Now, I can I we can leave it for, up for discussion as to why these might differ. I think, to me, it seems fairly straightforward, which is the pivotal voters, pivotal groups in Latin America, tend to be middle class urban consumers who are very sensitive to the real exchange rate because they're consuming a lot of importables, a lot of tradables, and cars and uh, electronic equipment and clothing and things like that. The pivotal uh, voters or electors or uh, actors in East Asian countries, which are very trade open, very export oriented, unlike Latin American countries, are in the export sector. All right? So that depreciating the currency in the run up to an election, which would not be a good idea in Latin America because it would impoverish the urban middle classes, is a pretty good idea in East Asia because it stimulates the export sector. All right? So this is simply an example of how we can apply some of these political economy tools to thinking about the incentives for government in different environments to, to manipulate or operate on the exchange rate for political purposes. Um, I mentioned already there is, in the book I talk about mo European monetary integration, I talk about exchange rate regime choice in Latin America, and I don't want to go into a lot of detail because I want to talk about other stuff. Um, again, stuff that is, that is, ad that is, goes beyond what's in the book. This is just to prove I did the work, I'll explain it now. Um, so go, let me go back a step here. So I looked at, um, as, as you know, after the euro was created um, without the participation of the transition economies in Central and Eastern Europe. And there has, since then really, and really, really since the transition, since the early 90s, one of the big issues for all of the Central and European and former, many of the former Soviet countries as well has been quote unquote exchange rate policy and specifically whether they would join the eurozone whether they would link to the euro and eventually whether they would join the eurozone. As you probably know, many of those countries have joined the eurozone, not all of them. Right? Um, but what, what I wanted to do with this is see whether the kinds of factors that I think are important in, in exchange rate policy more generally help us understand the national policy choices of countries in Eastern and Central Europe and the former Soviet Union. So that's, that's the, the, the reason for the study. Um, and this is more readable. Uh, and what, just to run you through the kinds of findings, 
the more open the economy is, that is, the, the, and I interpret this as being the more internationally exposed actors there are in an economy, the more likely it is to have a fixed exchange rate. The, the positive here means likelihood of adopting a, a, a peg, a de facto peg to the euro. And it's, well, first to the Deutsche Mark and then to the euro. All right, so the, 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 the more internationally exposed actors there are in an economy, the more likely to adopt the euro. The bigger the agricultural and manufacturing sectors, tradable sectors are, the less likely it is. These are all significant. The less likely the country is to adopt uh, a fixed rate. Um, the more important international debt and foreign direct investment are, the more likely to adopt a euro. Right? Um, the, I'll, I'm going to say a bit more about debt as we go on, but that's just to give you a sense that the, the, this Papers available so people can look at it. But since I want, what? Why is inflation associated with adopting a? Uh, uh, well, inflation has ambiguous uh, with a lower likelihood of adopting a peg. Inflation has ambiguous implications, right? Um, the on the one hand, if you, you if you want to bring inflation down, you can peg your currency, and that it will help you do that. The, on the other hand, if you peg your currency and you have high inflation, you're going to get a very strong real appreciation, which will impose real costs. And I think. If typically when I do studies like this, which I've done with a larger panel, and part of this is this relatively few countries over a relatively short period of time, um, but if you look across countries, when countries have hyperinflation or very high or hyperinflation, they're much more likely to adopt a peg. Right? These, these countries didn't in this period have hyperinflation. So they're just running 10 or 12 percent inflation, and adopting a peg would, 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 it would lead to a very strong real appreciation with really powerful anti-competitive effects. But, but here's sort of the take home point in a sense. So that was a study done based on data through the mid 2000s. I wanted to stop before the crisis. And then just to see how well the model that comes out of that does, I took that and took data from, uh, this, is, this is again, we, this before the crisis because the crisis, two things happened after 2006. The first is there's a crisis. The second, a bunch of countries joined the Eurozone. But take the data from 2006 and just apply it to the model from this previous 20 year period from, from the other work, 15 year period from the other work, and, and then predict what the, the, how likely it was for a country to have a fixed or a pegged rate in these instances. And you can see the ones in yellow are the ones that the model predicts are, going to, are more likely to have a fixed rate. The ones in light blue are the ones li less likely to have a fixed rate. Right? And the predictions are pretty, pretty accurate. Right? The ones mostly. The, the three Baltic states, which have now joined the euro, are expected to have a fixed rate. So are Bulgaria and Macedonia. And then Poland, Czech Republic, and Romania are predicted to be very unlikely to have a fixed rate. And in fact, they have floated right, and, and continue to float. Um, there's a lot of errors in forecasting here, as many of you will know. Both Slovakia and Slovenia have a, joined the eurozone. So you know, there's a lot more going on here in adopting the euro than this. But nonetheless, I think it, it shows that to some extent we can understand uh, national policy choice over the exchange rate in using at least some of the tools that I uh, suggest here. Now, going a little bit more in detail on this, uh, I want to talk, give you some examples and maybe even some suggestions of work that others, that others could carry on on this because I do think that this is an extraordinarily important and underappreciated area. Um, this is, I'm, the data are, come from Stephanie Walter's uh, work on this, but the, this is looking at the varied experience of countries in Central and Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union uh, based on their currency policies, right? So um, let's, let's do it this way. First to show you the effect of a particular currency policy just to demonstrate that it's important. So Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, the Baltic states, pegged to the, the euro originally, right? Um, they've now joined the euro, but this is a period in which they pegged to the euro. They pegged to the euro, the crisis hits. They have no independent monetary policy. As long as they're, if, if they stay on the peg, they lose monetary independence, right? So they had decided that they were going to stay on the peg, and we can leave aside why they decided that. I'll go back to that. Um, they, they stay on the peg, and as a result, they've got between 15 and 20 percent drop in GDP in one year. Actually, in most cases, GDP continued to drop through 2010, right? Um, unemployment skyrocketed from you know the four to six percent, seven percent level to twenty percent. Again, it continued to rise after into 2010. Latvia is sort of the poster child for this kind of extraordinarily brutal adjustment. 
Right? So in Latvia, over the course of the two years after the crisis hit, you had a 25, 26% drop in GDP. Unemployment went above 25%. There was a 20% drop in nominal wages throughout the economy. Right? The, it, uh, sort of almost an unprecedented crisis in, in, in Latvia. Very, very painful process. I'm not saying it was necessarily a bad choice, but it was, you know, for all intents and purposes, entirely the result of having chosen to stay on the peg. You know, the, if you re open up a textbook, you're hit with a shot like this in your Estonia, or Lithuania, Latvia, the textbook's going to tell you, devalue your currency. Right? And in fact, Poland and the Czech Republic did. So Poland devalues by 43% in the aftermath of the crisis. It is the only country in Europe that did not stop growing, that did not have a recession during the crisis. Its unemployment rate didn't move. The Czech Republic, which I guess we're now supposed to call Czechia, um, Czechia devalued by over 20%, had a small increase in unemployment and a shallow recession, but continued to grow after that. Right? So the countries with the flexible exchange rates really were able to weather the crisis quite well. The countries with the fixed exchange rates were faced with a huge shock. Now, you might ask, well, why might they do that? This first column gives some hints. Right? So with the peg that they had adopted, the Baltic states almost immediately, um, the banks in the Baltic states almost immediately began lending almost exclusively in euro, euro or Swiss franc, Swiss francs. So that by 2008, when the crisis hit, almost 90% of all, the, of all the bank loans in Latvia were denominated in euro or Swiss francs. The most important component of those bank loans was home mortgages. Right? Mortgages had typically been unavailable, and, and those of you who know Argentina or Latin America will know this is a story that also applies in a lot of Latin American countries. So mortgages had been largely unavailable in these countries before, but now with, mo with me stable monetary conditions and a stable exchange rate statement, low inflation, Banks were willing to lend in foreign currency, and so the mortgage market just skyrocketed. So all of a sudden, you've got 30 or 40 percent of the population of the Baltic states with home mortgages, but they're denominated either in euro or in Swiss francs. A 40 percent devaluation, like in Poland, would have effectively bankrupted many of the households that had taken out these mortgages. And there was mass political pressure not to move the exchange rate when the crisis hit. Now, you know, that then raises obvious distributional implications because what it means is that the government was protecting mortgage holders at the expense of all those people like public employees because the Latvian government, for example, imposed a, an across-the-board 20% reduction in nominal wages for all public employees. So it was weighing the interests of the, of the homeowners, the mortgage holders, against the interests of those who were suffering from the austerity measures imposed to try to maintain the peg, to maintain the fixed rate. Um, whether that choice was a good one or not is another matter, um, but the reality is that the government, I'm just trying to keep track of time, that the government chose to, fi to maintain the fixed rate in order to protect, among other reasons, and, and it was pretty explicit at the time. I mean, I've talked to people from the three countries and, and the, the secondary literature on it's pretty straightforward, that this was an almost direct response to the understanding that not only homeowners, but m many of the firms in the country were heavily indebted in euro and Swiss francs and would have been bankrupted had the government gone off the peg. Right? Poland had a much, Poland and Czechia had much lower rates of foreign currency debt. Um, pretty substantial in Poland, and that has since become a political issue. Uh, but, but, and that helps explain why in both of those countries it was a lot easier for the government to allow the exchange rate to drop as substantially as it did. Um, since it's 10 past, I'm going to skip through the next thing and just conclude. Um, so what I hope I've been able to demonstrate is that this is an important area of economic activity, economic policy. It is highly politicized. It is politically important. It is or should be the source of lots and lots of great dissertations and senior theses and things like that in political economy. There hasn't been a lot there. I mean, I, I, as I said before, I used to be the only person working on this. I'm not the only one now, but there aren't enough people working on it. I mean, the exchange rate is an important economic policy instrument and an important economic policy issue in almost every country around the world. And it's even gotten important in the US in, in recent years. And yet we have nothing like the literature on exchange rates that we have on trade or even foreign direct investment or international lending. And I think that's a gap in the literature that I would like to see filled. Um, 
I think that one of the reasons there for that gap is that we haven't had clear theories as to how to think about winners and losers, how to think about what the trade-offs are, and I tried to draw some together based on simple characteristics of firms and sectors and provide some empirical support for, for the argument that I'm making. Um, I would be the first to admit that both the theories that I've presented and the empirical evidence that I've been talking about is rudimentary and preliminary. Um, and so, like any good academic talk, I will end by saying we need more research. Okay, thank you. Well, so the answer may be no, because there's not much research that's been done. But has any research been done on, I guess, <coughs> sort of more... Whoa. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry about that. I, I guess I not more... not comment on your question. <laughs> Thank you. But I guess a more constructivist looks at it. Uh, I mean, like, for example, in East Asia, if maybe governments are more likely to lower rather than raise exchange rates prior to an election because people in those countries tend to gauge the health of the economy more based on the value of Hyundai stock and the New York Stock Exchange more than they do based on, you know, when I go to buy a TV, does it cost more or less? Yeah, I, well, so let me, let me broaden the question a little bit and say there are a variety of factors that could affect people's, especially the mass electorate's or public opinion's views of the currency, right? Um, most people, don't understand exchange rates. Um, I find when I teach undergraduates, you know, smart undergraduates, it's the thing they have the most trouble with. And part of that's because they're American. Um, if you go to Belgium or, you know, small open economies, people are used to thinking, you know, exchange rates are on the front pages, and so people are used to thinking about them. Nonetheless, people don't really understand them, perhaps, and, and they may have different cultural, ideological, other perceptual uh, characteristics in different environments. Um, to give you an example, it's generally regarded by most analysts uh, as a good idea for American presidents or American policymakers to say we want a strong dollar. Right? Uh, the reality is that most of the political action in the U.S. is from, it, 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 at least today for example, it ha has been, or in recent years, has been on the part of people who want a weaker dollar. Right? But it's seen as somehow impugning the power, strength, whatever of the American economy to say the dollar should be weaker. Now, Donald Trump has said the dollar should be weaker, and that's consistent with his view that you know, foreign competition is taking away American jobs and we should be more competitive on world markets or we should make foreign goods more expensive in world markets. But a lot of people see talking down the dollar as almost a recognition of weakness. Right? So that's the, all those things are possible. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule out any of these kind of ideological, cultural, other factors. It is ironic. I mean, I, I'm used to, since I you know, give, give talks like this or on this topic or around the world, you go to some countries and they'll say, but, you know, the reality is that everybody in Belgium or Germany or whatever believes that a strong euro or whatever the currency may be is a good thing. So it's easy to understand why we have a strong currency. And then you go to another country and they'll say, but everybody in Argentina understands that a weak peso is a good thing. So it's easy. So it varies by country, right? Um, I think that East Asian countries typically, as you imply, well, as the data imply and as experience indicates, East Asian countries tend to think of a weak currency as a good thing. Um, and Latin American countries tend to think of a strong currency as a good thing. Now, why that is, I mean, I have my own sort of, you know, economistic, materialistic, <coughs> rationalistic, whatever reason or explanations for that, but I'm sure there could well be cultural and ideological, intellectual uh, explanations as well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I just want to uh, think about that. I'm going to question you uh, just a bit because of time. You talk about the, uh, the pass-through mechanisms, but it's how international prices can affect the, the countries. Right. So my question would be, do you think, uh, could you give some examples of those kind of maxims would they look like in reality? And uh, are they more dependent on political factors such as regime types, like China and the US? Mm -hmm. Or more likely, more dependent on economic institutions, like you have a free market rule for all, or stuff like that. So yeah, right. a bit of That's, uh, you know, to be honest, I never, I have not thought a lot about this, the, the, 
potential political sources of differences and pass through. But let me tell you what the existing literature is mostly about. The existing literature is mostly about economic characteristics of the products, right? So the existing literature is largely about how more differentiated products, like with brand name recognition, you know, complex manufacturers, cars, and, and you know, thing, electronic equipment, in those instances where the producers are concerned about market share, and they're not going to raise, like, like the example of Japanese cars I gave, they don't want to raise prices 50% because, as you know, the marketing surveys show, the first brand of car you buy has a very strong impact on the brand of car you're going to buy over the next 50 years or whatever. So they don't want to lose market share in that sense. However, I think it's an intriguing question as to whether there may be political, cultural, regulatory, or other factors that can affect pass-through, and there certainly are. I mean, you know, if the government is, is playing some role in price setting in a country, then it's going to affect the, effect, the ex extent to which the exchange rate movement is passed through to prices, right? So we could think of instances, for example, in developing countries where food is heavily, either heavily subsidized or heavily taxed, the way the, depending on how you want to think about it, subsidized from the standpoint of urban consumers, taxed from the standpoint of farmers, well, that's an instance in which exchange rate movements are probably not going to be passed through to prices because those prices are so politically sensitive. Right? Um, in the case of the U.S., we actually we have something similar. That is, farm prices in some products are not that sensitive to the exchange rate because they're set politically. You know, sugar prices are almost entirely determined by American sugar policy, which keeps American sugar prices about three times as high as world sugar prices. Right? So that's an instance, I mean, sugar, sugar would, seen, would normally be seen as a product in which pass-through was complete, and it is in most countries that don't have American sugar policy, but we have a sugar policy that artificially keeps sugar much more expensive than, in, than on world markets, and so the exchange rate doesn't get passed pass through to prices. So I think there, there are both economic and political reasons why pass through may be limited. But I can give you an, an implication. So this is, I didn't do this, but since you asked, I gave you an opportunity. So this is a study that simply looks at how likely it is that producers will file anti-dumping suits, that is, claims for protection. And what it shows is that and this is work by, done by Lawrence, who comes in tonight, uh, and, and a graduate student. What it shows is that the, the, it is true that on average, when the currency appreciates, there are more filings of anti-dumping suits, that is, demands for protection. Uh, we just had one just yesterday um, by steel producers. But that that effect is entirely driven by, by firms in industries where pass-through is high and not industries where pass-through is low. Okay, so, um, so there, there's a big difference between the steel industry and pharmaceuticals, between textiles and software. All right, software and, and pharmaceuticals being, the, not always, but in many instances, uh, kinds of products where pass-through would be limited because they're highly product differentiated and, and, and complex, right? So in effect, I mean, the, the, the point is that the implications of exchange rate movements vary by the degree of pass-through, which is a function of the economic factors I've talked about and also the political ones that you've mentioned. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Professor. Uh, I have two questions about their total standard. Mm -hmm. um, Good. <laughs> favorite. Uh, during the Civil War, after the uh, uh, implementation of greenbacks, do you see a huge spike in interstate commerce in the North that the South does not have? And um, the second question is, uh, you know, given, given, I guess, the presumably non-negligible shipping costs of gold in at least the earlier years of the gold standard, to what extent did it really constitute an international unified currency, or did you get significant variation between the London gold price and the, I don't know, uh, Chicago, yeah. 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 Chicago. Yeah. Yeah, New York? Right. Um, so first question is about, so here's how I'm going to interpret your question. And tell me if I'm interpreting it. So did the formation of a truly national currency standard, which really only comes in 1863, have an impact on interstate commerce? Great question. I don't know that there have been systematic studies, because it's not clear how we would establish the counterfactual. I mean, I suppose the Confederate States of America might be. They were sort of at war at the, most of the time. And you know, the, the Confederate currency was basically worthless within a few months, because they, they had no backing for it. So, um, actually, 
the U.S. dollar circulated probably more widely in the Confederacy than did the Confederate currency. Um, the, oh, there are, people have done studies of this, that the, the, the value of the Confederate currency was basically entirely dependent on success on the battlefield, and after Antietam it collapsed, right? Um, and it was related to the ability of the Confederate States of America to borrow in London, right? So once they lost the ability to borrow in London, they had no money, no, no, no foreign currency, nothing to back their currency and the currency. I mean, it, it was hyperinflation by the end of the war. Um, but the, the, the crucial turning point is the National Banking Acts of, of 1863, with this, with it, which establish a national banknote system. That is, the, the, the money that we now see today, it looks a little bit different, but basically the money that we now use today, which is a federal current, currency backed by the federal government in one way or another, uh, and common around the country, whether it's on gold or off gold. There is no question that that transition is associated with a huge increase in intra-country, interstate commerce, investment, finance. It, it was associated with the creation of a, a true national banking system, which we didn't have before, and with an enormous increase in interstate commerce. However, it's very hard to know whether that was, what portion of that was due to the unification of the currency and associated with that the unification of the banking system and what portion was associated with the railroad, the steamship, you know, all sorts of other things going on at the time. My guess is that these are jointly determined. That we, you know, it would have been very difficult for the country to move forward with the fragmented monetary and banking system it had in the 1840s and 50s after the Civil War. We're creating a national market for the first time. Um, the West is being tied to the, the Midwest and the West are being tied to the East. Um, so I think that I don't want to say it was inevitable, but I think that to some extent, continuing on the, what we had in the 1840s and 50s, which was really state banking and state money, state banknotes, would, would have been inconsistent with the creation of a true national market. Um, but it's not clear how you would actually parse the direct effect of the common currency as opposed to other things that are going on at basically the same time. There are other examples that people have looked at. Um, the euro being an obvious one, the European monetary system, the euro, and then things like countries like Ecuador or Dominican Republic or El Salvador that adopt the U.S. dollar, uh, countries in Latin America that adopt common currencies or, or link their currencies to one another. The evidence is pretty overwhelming that it does encourage cross-border trade and even more cross-border finance and investment. There are lots of really interesting features of that early American experience. They, it, was, it was foundational in a lot of ways because uh, and a lot, of famous, a lot of the most famous American economists did, in macro especially, did their work on that greenback period because you had a major economy that was on a floating paper currency and people tried to understand what's the, what, what is the effect. Of the, I mean, and, and, you know, I didn't say this, but it didn't just float a little bit. I mean, the best way of looking at it is to see the value of the dollar against the pound sterling. So at one point, the dollar, the dollar before the war had been $4, U.S. dollar had been $4.86 per pound, which is where it eventually went back to. But it went up to $14 a pound, and it bounced around 14, down to 10, down to 6, back up to 9. So these are really, really big changes in the value of the dollar. And so economists back around the turn of the century are trying to figure out, well, how does that affect trade? How does it affect investment? How does it affect borrowing by Americans overseas? And so very important experience. There hasn't been much done on the politics of this, but, but I, you know, these, these issues are absolutely central in all of the political debates, actually going back to before the Civil War. You know, I have on my homepage is a, a piece that I did called Lessons for the Euro of Early American Monetary and Financial History, um, which starts with Alexander Hamilton, right, the refunding of the state debt, state's debts and the creation of a modern national financial system and takes us up to the Civil War. It stops in 1863. And this was like a central, I mean, the, probably the central economic policy issue along with the tariff all through this period. The ha Hamilton's proposals were brilliant, but they were largely overturned by what we might call sort of by frontier populist Jacksonian opposition, right? So the creation, we had a central bank, it was the un it wasn't its charter was not renewed. That was seen as a big mistake because it lost us the War of 1812. 
the central bank was recreated in 1816. The charter was not renewed again in 1836, and we had the biggest financial crisis in, at that point, uh, American history. Um, so going back and forth from the, 18, the 1780s through 1863, these issues were also absolutely central to American policy, and they remained central all through the 19th century. So I think there are tremendous opportunities to try to understand these better um, moving along. The, 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 the relevant, I'm not sure what I just said was relevant, but, but some of the relevance is that there actually is strong evidence that the lack of a national currency, because we can compare the the two eras in which we had a central bank before, we'll, before the Civil War. So we have, we have a central bank until 1816, or until 1812. Then we have one again from 1816 to 1836. So we can, and in those periods when we have the central bank, there is something like a unified monetary policy and a unified money. And that's what, that's what people like Jackson opposed and overturned eventually. So when, when we do that comparison, people have found Interstate trade went up, interstate finance went up, financial conditions became more stable, and so on and so forth. Not all positive, though, right? So, so one of the reasons Jackson and the frontiersmen hated the central bank and hated uh, the national monetary policy was that it was, what, like in the Eurozone, you know, when you have a common monetary policy for a highly variegated country, you've got areas in Alabama or Tennessee that are growing incredibly rapidly. The frontier is, going, is pushing westward you know, 10 miles every month. Right? And they have a huge demand for credit. They just want expansion, expansion, expansion. More money, more money, more money. But the more established, more conservative areas in the Northeast want more conservative macroeconomic and monetary policies, just like Germany versus Spain. Right? And so you've got this huge debate where Jackson says, these bastards in New York and Baltimore and, and, and Philadelphia and Boston are constraining economic growth in the frontier. Let's close up the central bank. And they do. So it's not all one way or the other. I mean, it's clear that once the central bank is, de is, is no longer in place, the frontier grows a lot faster, but also has a lot more financial crises. And there's bankruptcies and all sorts of other things. Um, trade grows, but it's trade with the rest of the world. It's not trade with the Northeast. When you have a unified national currency and a unified national banking system, there's a lot more trade among the regions of the country. There's slower growth on the frontier. So life's full of trade-offs, and this is one of them. Anyway, yes? Yeah, um, so this is just more of a curiosity question, and maybe this even goes also to the thinking about, from a graduate student standpoint, of pursuing this topic more. So a lot of your talk very much focused on the exchange rate as an instrument of trade policy, right? Very much focusing on how does it facilitate trade, how does it undermine trade, and so forth. But what about, I mean, you make allusions to it, you actually, when you were talking about the Confederacy there, you brought up, but what about the exchange rate as an instrument of acquiring external debt, mm -hmm. right, and being able to borrow abroad? And you didn't talk as much about that, but especially when I think about exchange rate, I mean, especially because I've looked a lot of debt, that's a lot of the ways I think about it. So which direction, obviously your presentation focused on one, but which direction do you think would be a more fruitful way of pursuing a study on the exchange rate politics? Uh, the quick answer is finance, like yours. Um, the, the less quick answer would be uh, that it would depend on the time period and the country. There are a lot of, as you know, there are a lot of developing countries that do not have and are unlikely to gain access to international financial markets at any point in the future. So if you're, you know, Congo or, or uh, you know, Ivory Coast, the financial components are probably a lot less important than trade. But if you're talking about the countries that you and I have come to know and love, like in Latin America and East Asia, then clearly access to international, not just finance, but also direct investment as well, uh, is crucially important. And, and that's where, frankly, that's where most of the action has been. And I, I have a graduate student who's worked on this in economics, but no one has been working on it on, on the political economy front. Um, there are huge stories here because the big, you know, if you, we look at the, what are now called the emerging markets, the more advanced in de uh, developing countries in Latin America and East Asia. So, so this is a stylized picture of what's happened over the last 15 years, 20 years, say, since the late 90s, early aughts, right? Um, these countries have effectively achieved low and stable inflation, right? As opposed to having 40% inflation, they have something comparable to what we have in the developed world. They have achieved stable exchange rates. Many of them have pegged 
successfully, either with a hard peg or you know, some kind of target zone, uh, adjustable peg, to the uh, euro or the, euro, typically the euro or the dollar. So this is an environment in which I wouldn't say they have fixed rates, but they have much more fixed rates than they have had in the past. And those fixed rates are much more credible than they have been in the past because inflation is so low in countries like Mexico or Korea or you know, Malaysia, things like that. So the result of that has been that foreigners are now much more willing to lend to these countries in their own currency. Right? So the big story in international finance, especially development finance over the last 15 years, is that for the first time in world history, that's going to sound that's grandiose, for the first time in world history, developing country governments can borrow in their own currency from foreigners. And the way that works is the Thai government will float bonds in the domestic capital market, and they'll be bought by funds, pension funds, exchange-traded funds, hedge funds in New York, London, Tokyo, Hong Kong. Virtually the entirety of Thai and Peruvian government debt is held by foreigners and, and is denominated in local currencies. Okay? So that's, that's an impact of their having stable and credible exchange rates. Uh, associated phenomenon is people trust the government enough on that front, but all, in, in even the cases I just gave, borrowing is still, by the private sector, is still in foreign currency. So Thai and Peruvian private companies borrow in dollars or in, in euro or in yen. Right? Uh, that then faces the government with a real problem because, say, it runs into debt servicing problems. Well, you know, what does the government do if it can't pay its debts? It solves the problem the old-fashioned way. It prints money. Right? But if the Thai government prints money in order to be ser able to service its bot Thai currency debt, the currency collapses, and all these foreign currency debtors in the private sector are bankrupted. So the trade-off has simply changed. This is, some, this, is, this is something that is now well recognized by people in, in the, both in the markets and economists who follow this thing, but there's been basically no political analysis of the pressures that this puts on governments from Brazil and Peru to Thailand and South Korea. Right. So you're absolutely right. These, these, these issues are crucially important. They typically show up more sh most sharply in financial markets because obviously, I mean, the exchange rate is, a, is more a financial indicator than a trade indicator. Um, and they're politically hot potatoes, you know, you know very important issues. Time. Okay. But, but I can't resist the, the temptation to ask one, one last question. Okay. Um, so, the, the, whole, the whole theory, in a way, is built around winners and losers, right? And so we think about how political scientists think about things like exchange rate policy. We think in terms of winners and losers. But I think, to make a very broad generalization, I think economists would tend to think of it in terms of efficiency. And the idea is that if we choose the most efficient exchange rate, that everybody's going to win, right? And so there's a world in which we have, you know, so there's different kinds of worlds that we, that we theorize from. And I'm wondering if, are there ever examples, or when we think about, like, say, the, the East Asia example you gave, where you show the, you know, the decline exchange rates before, is it ever the case that the economists are, are right, in a way, or that, or that their way of looking at it is, is enough? And in fact, I'm actually getting inspiration from this from, from your earlier work, because in, in your first book, the, the argument to a large degree, and what I drew from it, was the idea that in certain times, you know, times are good, distributional conflict is what really dominates. But there are other times, times of crisis, and the like, when actually concern with the general investment climate, mm -hmm. the, the general health of the national economy can trump that and overwhelm that. And I just wonder if there's, is there something analogous here, where maybe there are, could you imagine there are limits to when it's not so much about winners and losers, but you could sort of say, no, if we lower the exchange rate, it's going to be so good for the national economy as a whole that, it, that the economist's vision of a world like what's efficient is actually producing winners across the board is actually borne out. Right. So. Um, that's, that's the next half hour, but uh, so let me try to do it quickly. The first thing is that there isn't, in fact, a lot in the arsenal of modern macroeconomics that tells you what exchange rate policy you should pursue. Um, Jeff Frankel has a famous article called No Single Exchange Rate Policy is Right for All Countries at All Times. Um, and on the level issue, it's pretty much purely distributional. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll temper that in a moment. Because then it's just, you know, strong currency helps some people and hurts others, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are two, com two 
caveats or two instances in which I think economists do have a tool or a set of tools that, uh, that have some welfare implications. The first is this literature, what's called the optimal currency area literature. And this is the literature that, that, that tries to explain under what circumstances it makes sense for a country to give up its currency and join a currency area. Now, as you probably know, when people applied that literature to the Eurozone, they found that basically there were no countries for which it held. So, you know, you know maybe Belgium, maybe Austria, you know. Uh, by the same token, when people have applied the optimal currency area literature to the U.S., they find that the U.S. is not an optimal currency area either, so we shouldn't have a common currency. But there is, the, but the optimal currency area literature does push in a particular direction. That is, it does, it does have some indications. That is, it, sa it says, for example, the more flexible your labor markets are, the more labor can move among these areas, the better off you are or the, the lower the cost of having a common currency. The more your factor markets are integrated, the lower cost of having a common currency. The more you trade with one another, the higher the, the benefits of having a common currency. So those are some of the indications. Um, I think virtually every economist working in this would say, we can tell you what this literature says. We don't, about optim, optimal policy, we don't really have any indication that governments are acting on it, right? Um, but there is another somewhat more controversial set of applications. That's about developing countries with weak real exchange rates. There's a very strong school of thought, Donnie Roderick being an example, but many development economists believe that developing countries should have weak exchange rates um, for very straightforward reasons. A weak exchange rate gives domestic producers incentives to produce for foreign markets. It, it's, it's, it's a way of promoting exports. It's a way of pushing your producers into world markets. And there is, there is not a, I mean, from a Ricardian standpoint, from a neoclassical standpoint, this should not matter. But sort of modern trade theory tends to focus on how learning by doing matters, how, how networks matter, how developing countries need to, or developing country producers need to learn how to produce goods up to world quality standards, how, to, how they need to get into global supply chains, how that can be well for improving. I think most development economists would agree with Donnie Roderick that having a weak real exchange rate is a good idea for a developing country, right? Um, which then raises the question of why so many developing countries have such strong real exchange rates, um, which then takes us back to distributional things. But I think, I think it's always, one of the things that I, that one of the, one of the ways in which exchange rate policy differs from trade, and one of the reasons, which is a, in my view, is a good thing from a political economy standpoint, is that there is a very clear welfare baseline in trade. Virtually the entirety of our work in trade is, can be anchored by saying free trade is the optimum. All the economists agree on that. So what we're trying to explain is why and how countries deviate from that optimum, right? There is no welfare baseline in, in exchange rate policy. You can't, I mean, you just can't point to an exchange rate policy that the U.S. should be pursuing. What should we do? Should we fix to the euro? Should we float? Should we have a strong dollar? Should we have a weak dollar? No economist is going to say there is an optimal policy. It just can't be identified. And that, to me, is great because then it's all up to us. Right? Good. So before we wrap up, I just make two final thank yous. I was remiss at the beginning. I thanked my faculty board. I didn't thank the people who actually make Scissor work day in, day out. Uh, my associate director, Manuel Viedma, who has really helped get us off the ground. Uh, Thomas, Thomas Galkin and Fadi Hakim, who have taken care of all this and the filming and the beautiful poster and all of this. So thank you guys to everyone who made this, this go. But most of all, thanks to, to Jeff Frieden for coming out, kicking us off in a really, really great way. So join me in thanking Jeff. Hey, thanks a lot.